Hello everyone again! <laughs> it's Catherine here from Croydon Vision and I have managed to turn on the sound this time. Uh, welcome to our event on today, the 23rd of July. We're welcoming back those who've been with us and we're welcoming those who are new for the first time. As I said, I'm Catherine, I'm the Resource Manager and I will be sending any questions on to our presenters. So, just a little bit of background on Croydon Vision before we start. We are a specialist charity who encourage independence, confidence and growth amongst local residents who are blind and partially sighted. We've been supporting and encouraging members for almost 100 years and we're really excited about that. We are passionate about assisting our members to achieve their personal goals and retain as much independence as they can. Last week, we were cooking meatballs in the kitchen with Aisha and she was really lucky, nice. She let us try some after we finished. We were very, very pleased about that. And then afterwards, we had a fun quiz based on travel. And I'm very sorry about the questions. We promise to try and make them easier next time, not quite as difficult. This week, we are being joined to begin with by one of our trustees, Druven. He specialises, uh, well, he is an optometrist and he's the founder of OcuShield and they are looking after people's eyes in a digital age. After that, we're going to have Innes and Jennifer join us and they're going to be talking about how they have coped health-wise during the lockdown period. So do feel free to type any comments or questions. I will pass them on at the moment to Druvin and later on to Innes and Jennifer. And just give me a moment to change over the feed to Druvin and make sure that I don't leave him on mute so you can hear him as well. So just give me a moment there. And now we are over to you, Druvin, to feel free to introduce yourself and tell us what you're going to tell us. I'm very excited. Hey, everyone. It's a pleasure being here. Um, as Catherine said, uh, did a fantastic job on the intro. Um, but just to yeah, reiterate, uh, my background is optometry. Uh, and while I was studying at university, I did some research on how something known as blue light affected the physiology of the eye and circadian rhythms, which is how we sleep. And out of that, I went and did some more research and built a business around it to help people using screens in a digital age. So I think um, today I'm going to be discussing blue light, but also ergonomics. Um, so that's how we use screens, how we're using our desks, um, eye strain, and um, a few other questions. But if you guys do have any questions, just drop them down to Catherine as we go through. I'd rather answer them as we're going through and speaking about them rather than at the end. Um, but yeah, let me kick off. Um, so first of all, I think the first question we had was, what is blue light and how does it affect you? So blue light simply, if you look at the visible spectrum of light, um, a lot of people are familiar with UV light. So we wear sunglasses in the sun that block out UV light. And that's light that is sits between zero to 400 nanometers. And then we have something known as visible light, which sits between 400 and 700 nanometers. Um, after 700 nanometers, you have microwave rays or x-rays for example but we're concerned with the visible light spectrum so at 400 nanometers you have the colors such as blue and on the other side 700 you have colors such as red and orange and the concern with the blue light is um, this wavelength of light is actually shorter and it carries higher energy so this means less of it is required to affect our health and well-being now one of the big key things here is if some of you suffer from macular degeneration or know about macular degeneration one of the risk factors alongside smoking, for example, is blue light. And blue light, one of the biggest sources of blue light is actually the sun itself. Um, other sources of blue light is LED lighting around us and also digital devices. A good way to decipher if there's blue light in anything around us is the color of the light. If it's very white, then you'll find out that actually um, the light has a lot of blue light in it. And this is important because as I mentioned before, it's shorter wavelength, it's higher energy and it causes more issues. And when we're talking about the problems it causes is it affects us in two ways. One is our eyes. So actually blue light, it affects our visual system. This is because our eyes have to work harder to break down the blue light because it causes aberrations. So you can get eye strain, you can get headaches, and this is all because of the cumulative exposure. So that's the short term when it comes to the eyes. Long term, as I mentioned, macular degeneration is obviously um, something that can um, play a part when it comes to this because cumulative exposure to blue light over a lifetime can result in macular degeneration coming through. Sorry, I'm just going to mute this because I think there's some 
noise is coming through. Give me one second. Okay, nearly there. That's okay. I had problems with lack of sound earlier. <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't want. I don't want it to be pinging off while everyone's listening, and then it's a it's a frustrating. I've been there, so all right, there we go. Let's. Brilliant. Thank that. you so much. That's all right. Um, perfect. Okay, good. Yeah. So as I was talking about macular degeneration, um, the the key thing here to note is the sun is the biggest source of blue light. So you know the intensity is very strong. So if you're in the sun for a few minutes, the amount of blue light you're going to get is far greater than you know when you're looking at a light source inside or when you're looking at screens. But one of the biggest factors is, as well as intensity, is proximity and duration. So if you spend, let's say, 50 years looking at a screen, you know, at the moment, there's research that's showing, you know, the initial problems of blue light exposure from different sources, but there hasn't been research done into, you know, dozens of years, because if you look at how long devices, for example, have been out for LED lighting, it's only, you know, 10 to 20 years so research is at a really early age here but we do have kind of studies on animals and families and cohorts that show that there is a risk there especially for children for example so children's lenses in their eyes don't develop through the teenage years and the lens is actually really important at absorbing uv or blue light so children actually are more susceptible to uv or blue light damage so any of you that have children or families with children you should always be recommended even in an overcast day outside is wearing sunglasses because there's a lot of UV light emitted and then also when you're indoors or looking at screens you know you want them to be protected from UV light. Second thing on the other side of the spectrum is when we get a little bit older the lens gets a little bit darker due to the cataracts and gets a bit thicker and I'm sure some of you have had cataracts removed. Now the cataracts actually serve as a natural um, natural absorber of blue light but when it's removed you have a clear window again and this can also mean that you're absorbing more blue light and as we get older there's something called the macular pigments which are absorbing blue light naturally which we have a lot of when we're younger but as we get older they deteriorate that's why when you see your optometrist or your uh, gp they're always telling you to eat your green vegetables your bright vegetables because it actually strengthens the pigments within the eye which is lutein and zeactin which absorb the blue light um so you know those are the two risk two main risk groups which you know you should be looking at how blue light's interfering a little bit more so um, than others. So the eyes, I mentioned short term, which is the eye strain and headaches. You've got long term impacts, which is such things like macular degeneration. Secondly, blue light affects us in the way we sleep. So something known as a sleep wake cycle. So we have a system within the body which tells our tells our body, you know, it's it's the daytime and the nighttime. So it, our bodies are really clever. So when the sun rises, the blue light in the morning tells our body that it's the day because it's a uh, it's, a, it's effectively, it's, it's natural alarm clock. So if you look at the caveman days, we used the sun to, love, to tell us it was the, the morning and then obviously pitch blackness to tell us it's you know, the night. And what we're doing here is we're replicating the sun in our home environment. So when the sun sets in the UK, let's, let's talk about winter, for example, when I think it's as early as 3 p.m. sometimes and it gets really dark when you're working, you're going, home, going home from work or you know if you step out. Um, if you start using devices in the evening, let's say from 6 p.m. onwards, you're creating a replicating effect of the sun. And what that does, it tells your body that actually, no, it's the daytime. So something known as melatonin, which is an important hormone for the body, it actually doesn't get secreted. And melatonin is a hormone which tells your body it's time to sleep. If your melatonin levels, melatonin levels are low, then your body won't be ready for sleep. So if, even if you try to go to bed, you'll be shuffling around, really finding it hard to fall to sleep. So that's why melatonin is important. And blue light is something that stops melatonin being produced. So again, being inside, if you have a lot of white LED lighting in your homes, you're gonna be suppressing melatonin. Or if you're looking at screens indoors, which are really bright and very close proximity, you're again, gonna be delaying that melatonin production. So these are two key things that we should watch out for and be concerned about when it comes to the blue light, in our eyes and our sleep. So just before I move on, um, Catherine, was there any questions regarding that first segment? I think you've answered it so clearly, we haven't had any yet. <laughs> Perfect. So <laughs> I, that's good to hear. So I'm going to move on if there is any questions. Of no, I just, 
I found it very interesting knowing about the um, that children were more susceptible to, to damage from, from light and I will be making sure that even though I forgot my sunglasses this morning I have a spare pair at work and I will be wearing them on the way home <laughs> to protect it's them on the way home. Yeah, it's, 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 something, I know it's, it's something we know about but it's, we've just got to get into our routines to you know be aware of these things so yeah it's definitely uh, advisable. Um, Okay, the second question was, I've heard blue light filters help with better sleep. Why is this? So I touched on it previously, you know, if we're limiting the blue light exposure that our eyes are receiving, your body is going to be able to function and produce the melatonin as normal. Therefore, you'll be able to sleep properly and um, fall asleep properly, but also um, sleep well rest. You know, you'll be well rested with the body. Even when you're sleeping, you could be actually sleeping not very well. So, you know, some people stay half they stay half awake, half asleep. You want to be in a deep cycle of sleep. And what happens when you're in a deep cycle of sleep? Something called rapid eye movement. When that stage happens, it's actually telling you your body's gone through a vital stage where it's, it's cleansing the brain of uh, toxins. Your body's revitalizing, you know, for the next day ahead. Um, but if you're not, you know, blue light can also cause you not to fall into that deep sleep, which is needed. So using a blue light filter can help. Um, and also just to note, with anything when it comes to health people everything is subjective so one person i'll give you an example so if someone smoked if for example someone smokes a cigarette one person can smoke one cigarette and they'll be really affected by a cigarette and they won't be able to maybe jog for a few minutes whereas someone can smoke 20 cigarettes and they could still go for a jog so different the same way with blue light some people are more easily affected by blue light and some others aren't so these are things to to also log within your body and to know how you feel because again when it comes to sleep sleep is such a complex um phenomenon that there is other things at play so you should always try and create a diary as well when you're looking at how to sleep better but blue light is one of those things that can impact your sleep we we have a question from the previous section uh yeah. sometimes it's a little bit delayed on facebook so it takes a little bit of time for them to come through uh, there's a question is there any way you can reduce floaters from, from looking at bright lights? Floaters, so with floaters, it's one of those things where you will see them more, the more you pay attention to them. So floaters are effectively transparent liquids within your eye. And the reason you see a black backdrop is because it's a shadow that's being cast on that transparent fluid. So what I always say to patients is stop trying to follow the floaters or look for them because your brain is actually very clever. So I have something called a blue dot cataract, which I was born with. It's something congenital. And it's, again, it's something that's within my eye, but because my brain's learned to look through it, I can't see this opacity in my eye. Um, so the body and the brain is really smart. It can really adapt. But if you pay more attention to the floaters, rest assured, you will keep seeing them. So what I'll say is try to keep going on about your day-to-day -day life without trying to focus on them. You will see more of them on light and backdrops in your environment. Um, so that if you did want a solution, you might want to paint the walls a little bit darker colour, that might help, but that is a drastic uh, example. Thank you very much for that. No problem. Um, okay, just going to move on to the third question. Um, so as a visually impaired person, I find that having a blue light filter on at all, time, all times helps me have it less glare. Is there a reason for this? So yes, there is a reason for this. So as I mentioned, blue light is a short wavelength of light and it causes more aberrations in light. Now, because there's more aberration, your visual systems have to work a lot harder to uh, decipher that and then turn it into something that we can visually see. Therefore, if you are using a blue light filter on all the time, you are gonna experience that less glare, less of that effect. So I can definitely see why that's helping. So I would recommend keep on using that um, blue light filter that you use. Thank you so much. I think that was just a... It really helps. Why does it help? <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> knowing why is more is very important. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Are we, are we good to move on to the next question? We are. Thank you very much. Perfect. So next question is, phones and tablets have a built-in blue light filter. Is software filters better than a physical filter? This is a really good question. Um, and one I get asked quite a lot. Um, and my answer is neither is better or neither is worse i'd recommend everyone to use the software which is free on your devices if you have iphone or android you can simply go into settings and it'll either be on an, on an android it's called um night sorry 
it's called yes it's something along the lines of night mode or blue light filter and you can turn it on on iphone it's called the night mode um they usually turn on in the evening because they were rolled out once the sleep side of things was proved conclusive beyond doubt which was basically blue light was definitely affecting sleep um so manufacturers made the software turn on automatically in the evening now obviously there's research about the eyes being affected so therefore you should be turning just leaving it on all the time i mean one of the downsides of the filters um sorry the blue light software is it turns your screen very orange now when it comes to healthcare compliance is a big big issue so we know we can we can remain healthy by using things but if we don't use them such as the software then the the, the solution is redundant basically so for example the filters that official my company makes is we've been able to create a, a nice balance between um aesthetics and also blue light filtration so our products don't turn your screen very orange and ugly which makes it look like a retro 90s or 80s look um so this is really useful for example with children now children again they like to be very cool they like to be on instagram netflix and they don't want an orange filter on their screen and they'll just turn software off even though the parents have recommended it to them but parents will buy the products and put it onto their child's device because they know they're being protected and the child's not going to pick up a, a fuss or take off that product so that's a that's a good example of, you know when to use what products but i'd say definitely use the software if you don't like the software for whatever reason you know go with the aesthetics i'd say get a physical filter because that way you'd still be protected but you're not going to you know you're going to be using the product at the end of the day brilliant i i got a question for myself i said i don't tend to notice a blue light filter after about an hour yeah if, of of actual use but i have it, it's occasionally i suddenly look at my screen and go why is everything really red <laughs> Yeah, is no, that just your brain sort of filtering it out? Yeah, yeah. So again, it's one of those things when you turn it on, you'll be like, "Wow, this is really orange." But as you said, you you know, you'll get used to it. So some people, if you just leave it on, you'll get used to it. But then after you come to a realization when you're watching, or you put on a word document or something white back, and you're like, "Wow, this is red. I don't I don't know why this is," and you, you kind of just notice it after a while. So uh, yeah, that happens. I think it's for me. It's with faces. It's just like everyone's really blushing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, my red light filter on. So I better turn it off for this meeting. <laughs> yeah, 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 that happens as well. You've got to be careful as well when you've got it on because it can affect. I mean, we have examples of people that are like graphic designers or like their photography. Yeah. And if you're doing photography, you know, if you've got something that's changing the colours, then it's going to affect your output. So, you know, you've got to be mindful of that. Okay, thank you very much. It's it's just just lots of comments are very very helpful, and very interesting so far. Good, good, good. <laughs> And the next question, I've already touched on it. it said, should I use a blue light filter in the evening or can I use it on all the time? I recommend using it on all the time. Um, you know, you do need some blue light in your life to, in the morning to tell your body it's the daytime, but you're not going to get that from screen. You need to be getting that from outside. So step outside if you're if you're not doing that already, especially in a time of a pandemic and a lockdown. You need to be going outside every day. I mean, I've experienced it myself. Being indoors for two days in a row, you then start realizing that it's a uh, you know you need to get outside because yeah being being inside can um yeah can af can affect your health but also your mental well-being thank you so much okay. <laughs> am i good to move on to ergonomics you are good to move on perfect so just moving on to ergonomics question because my vision is very low i need to have the screen closer to me than generally then generally it is said to be required is there anything i should do with help preventing bad posture. So this is a really good question and something that I've kind of uh, been trying to work out while being at lockdown working from home on a screen. Now with posture you've got to make you've got to make sure that one you have a very good um you've got to have a very good chair that supports your back and make sure your back is straight um but also support at the bottom and the top of the back. You should also make sure that your knees are a little bit higher than your hips. Um, and if you're using a screen, you need to make sure your elbows are supported. So I've got a, you can't see it here, but my chair has something where I can rest my elbows and I can type away. Those are the three main things which I would uh, look at when looking at your kind of chair setup. Um, the other thing is your screen. So your screen should be, I'd say, about 10 to 20 degrees lower than your natural eyesight. That way, you know, your your head and your te sorry, your your head and your neck it has a natural um, inclination to be a little bit lower. Um, so you don't want it to be 
directly straight ahead because you're still activating your your neck muscles. You want it to be a slightly bit lower. That way it can relax and it can look at where your you know your screen that you have at play. Um, and especially when you have multiple monitors, again, you want it to be as easy as possible. Um, so that would be my advice when it comes to uh, posture and screens. Um, I'm just looking back over it to make sure I've answered your question rather than waffling on. Um, yeah, so I, I understand you're bringing the screen closer. So I think, you know, you're having to do that because, you, you know, you have to see the screen, which is obviously you, you need to do that. But yeah, just don't, you know, make sure you have a support when you're doing that. If you're coming closer, make sure, again, your your back is not in no man's land. You want it to be right up against something where possible. So if, if you can't do that because the chair doesn't allow, I'd recommend putting some cushions in place. So at least the, the lumbar, your lower part of your back is supported. Um, and then again, if you're doing, if you're staying on the screen for hours uh, on on the day, definitely take a break every 30 to 45 minutes in that position because you are going to suffer, um, if not short-term problems, you'll suffer long-term problems from the way your mucoskeletal muscles work and how it changes um, your your kind of uh, your posture in the long term. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pop in and uh, just put a, a bit in on that question. I know access to work will always recommend a monitor arm, so you can move the monitor to the exact position closer to you rather than you leaning forwards. 100%, yeah, definitely. I think um, there's a lot of tools out there to make sure the monitors are in the right way, but yeah, definitely, you don't want to be leaning too forward. I also say with screens is make sure you're at arm's length away. Mm -hmm. um, so make sure you can just about touch the screen. If you're within that limit, then you're, you're bit too close but again if you're visually impaired and you need to be then that's you know that doesn't work. yeah okay thank you very much no problem okay so this is the last question i have so we have approximately eight minutes so if anyone has questions make sure you get them in now so uh Catherine can send them to me after answer this question um so the last question is after using a screen for a long time my eyes feel tired is there anything i can do to prevent it um so this is a really good question so your eyes can feel tired for multiple ways. There's a, there's a terminology called computer vision syndrome, um, which defines how your eyes are affected. So your eyes are affected one internally, but also, also externally. So internally, we're talking about kind of headaches and eye strain. Externally, you're talking about dry eyes, red eye and irritation. So all these things can happen when you're looking at the screen. So let's first of all, let's talk about um, externally. So you can get dry eyes, red eyes, and irritation when you're looking at the screen because a few things happen. One is your blink rate is reduced when you're looking at a screen. So you should be blinking maybe seven to 15 times in a minute. But when you're looking at a screen, you blink one to three times. Now, the blink in your eye is actually a very important function. What it does, it, it re-lubricates your eyes. And that lubrication method obviously keeps your eyes healthy, safe. And also, you know, if any bacteria lands on it, it can also... Uh, kind of uh, get rid of those problems. So the blink is very important. Now, if you're not blinking as much, your eyes are gonna get dry. And when they get dry, they become irritated and they become red. So this is one of the key things. And, you know, it's very hard to remember blinking when you're on a screen because blinking is a subconscious kind of element to our body. So what I recommend is anyone who uses screens is write on a post-it note, blink and put it on the right or left corner of the screen. That way you will see it and you'll be like, right, I need to blink now. Um, so I'd recommend doing that. And also you wanna look at your environment. So when we're in offices, generally here in the UK in the winter, for example, we have heating on uh, very high. And in the summer, when eventually we hit 30 degrees, which we haven't yet, but hopefully we do, um, the AC, if we have AC, uh, we turn AC up and it gets very cold. Again, that can dry out the surface, surface of the eye. So you can get the irritation there which then leads to eye strain. Now, speaking about intrinsically inside the eye, um, headaches and eye strain. So we've talked about blue light. Another reason you're getting eye strain is um, your eyes converging. So when we look at something at a, a near point, your eyes are looking inwards. And that uses two things. It uses something called accommodation and convergence, which are both kind of in intertwined. And your eyes, your eyes can only do this for a certain amount of time. So if you're doing this for, let's say 10 hours a day, your eyes are really gonna feel that. It's like, it's like having a workout, you know, if you're using that muscle constantly, effectively it is a muscle. So if you're using that constantly, you're gonna feel the eye strain. So again, 
there's something called the 20 20 20 rule which i'm sure you are all familiar with if not it's basically every 20 minutes um you want to be looking away from the screen for 20 seconds 20 feet away so that means out the window down the corridor anything which just allows you to re reset your visual system and that's going to be key in relaxing the muscle the same way if we do a workout we need to have a rest um, the same applies here. So again, I recommend that every 45 minutes. Um, and then we have headaches, which again, lead from the blue light convergence issue as well. Um, I think it's all kind of part and parcel of that issue there. So I think if you maintain the breaks, if you're maintaining the distance from your screen, as I said, you know, arms length away, and you're reducing blue light. Another quick tip is to reduce the brightness of your screen. So again, intensity is very important here. If you reduce intensity, you're gonna reduce blue light and also the aberrations your eyes are, your eyes are uh, receiving. So I think uh, to conclude, that is my last point on that. Now over to you, Catherine, if you have any questions at all. We do, we have a couple of questions. So one of them's going back to, I think a lot of the things you've said previously, we've all been talking about computers and phones is that the same for a tablet as well? Sort of the, the distancing and the blue light? Yeah, so tablets and phones are really, it, it's a strange one. Because they're devices we have to hold to use them, you know, natively we're always going to be holding it at least a half or arm's length away. Now, I think it's, it's a lot tougher here because usually sweet smartphones and tablets, you're not supposed to be using them as long as you do with a computer because they're more for entertainment or on the go. Mm -hmm. But we, we know now that, for example, children, for example, um, just spend ages on a tablet because they may not be doing homework. Because we know, you know, government puts you iPads to do work, for example. So it's very hard to do that. But I'd recommend them to put it on a screen, on a, sorry, on a stand and put it on a desk where they can, you know, look at it and, and do their work. But if you're going to be doing it in an environment where you're having short bursts of using a smartphone or a tablet, you are okay to use it within your arm's length. Um, just make sure you're not using it for too long. Again, I'd say, you know, if you're doing it in within 30 minute bursts, it's fine. But if anything longer, you need to set yourself up so you have maybe a stand and you can interact with it in, a, in another means. That's really interesting. And, and another one, uh, one of our members has said, I have macular damage. Why do I see phantom movement? So interesting. Uh, that's a very good question. When you say macular damage, is that through wet AMD or dry AMD or both? That could take us up to 20 seconds to get an answer for. So, <laughs> so sorry, she's, is it she or he's seen phantom? Uh, she's seen phantom movement. Okay, fine. So yeah, you with the macula, because it, it is a, a central, it's part of the fovea where we see our central, um, where it's responsible for our central vision, you know, it's, it, it holds a very important role. And when you have retinal cells which are damaged, so each point on our retina, especially our macula, corresponds to a point in our vision. Now, if it's damaged, you have a gap effectively in your vision. Now that gap can be, you know, it leads to things where our brain can start interpreting information which isn't there as something else. So it could be a, the phantom Im image you're seeing could be something which is um, already stored in your memories or, or it's an inter interpretation of your brain trying to interpret something visually, but it can't now because those rods and cones in your retina are damaged within that area. Um, also, with the phantom images, I'll, for that the person that asked, it will be um, interesting to also speak a little bit more on that. Because there's something also called Charles Bonnet syndrome, which you know it might tie into that. It might mm -hmm. not be related, and I definitely recommend that patients speak reaching out to the optometrist on that more and mentioning Charles Bonnet syndrome if they don't know already what that is. Um, apparently, the the reason for the macular damage is a macular hole. If that helps. Okay. <laughs> so the macular hole is obviously going to be yeah, it's going to be as impactful as yeah. um, because yeah, it's, you know, it's affecting that macular straight on. And we'll give a little bit of time in case there are any more comments from, from members, but I think you've, you've given so much information that you answered all of the questions that you would have been asked. Well, that's amazing. I think we did it in good timing as well. Look, it's 4.30, bang on. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. It has been really interesting to me and I'm really interested to our members because they are all saying so and very helpful. And we're all going to make sure that we've all got our red light filters on and that we are wearing our sunglasses and we're not damaging our maculas any more than we have done over the past however many years we've used technology.
No, perfect. And I look forward to seeing everyone again at Croydon Vision soon. Hopefully, uh, I can pop in sometime soon when the, when there's something going on. But um, It would be great to have you. And, and I know that you are planning on coming with us to Box Hill and we'll remind members about that later as well. Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm putting my down for the lovely uh, Box Hill hike. So thank you so much, Druvin. I'm just going to pop everyone on the B right back soon whilst I say goodbye to Druvin. Bye-bye, everyone.